1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by the which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory the things which I delivered unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, and that he was buried and rose again the third day. Sometimes that's called the core of the gospel. I have a little trouble with that expression, maybe thinking that maybe this is really more significant than any other part of the gospel because it's all tied together. But certainly this is the centerpiece where Jesus died and he is buried and he rose again. Paul, as he begins the book of Romans, tells us that he is declared to be the son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. And Matthew is writing the things that he is writing so that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ. And his resurrection is really the, the crowning piece of evidence to the fact that Jesus is the Christ. And so we're going to be reading that story tonight. It's the, the story we were singing about and the song we were just singing about we saw thee not, but we believe, and we believe because of the things we've heard it's the story we sing when we sing, tell us the old, old story of Jesus and his love. And so this is really a very important part of the scriptures. It's told at least four times and then alluded to several times in the epistles. We have it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they all don't tell us the same things, but everything they say all fits together. And there's a lot of this. I'm gonna to try to keep my attention focused on what is in Matthew, because that's what we're studying, but there's so much of this you have heard so many times. I'll be alluding it on occasion to some of the things told in the, the other accounts as we go, because you just can't hardly help but do that. But let's turn now to Matthew chapter 27. We'll begin reading in the middle of verse 26. The verse 26 begins when Pilate releases Barabbas unto them, and then we're going to see where they take Jesus out and begin this process of putting him to death. And we'll read on through chapter 28, verse 20, the end of the book of Matthew. And by the time we do this, we will have read through the entirety of the book of Matthew on Sunday evenings. We will do it again. This Wednesday evening, we'll read that. And so we will have read the entirety of the book of Matthew twice on Sunday and Wednesday evenings in these last six months. And I think that's something that is uh, pretty special anyway. So let's begin. First, we got some memory verses, three memory verses. Matthew 27, 64. Command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Matthew 28 in verse six. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. In Matthew 28, 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. All right, now let's read the text and I'll provide a little commentary as we go. We'll begin with the passion and the crucifixion. This is his death. And when he had scourged Jesus, the scourging. You don't read a lot about the scourging in the book of Matthew. I understand, I didn't see the movie about the, the crucifixion of Christ. I understood they put a lot of attention in on the scourging, trying to depict what that was. 
I've read several accounts and I think there's some value to going into understanding just how awful this was and, and people read, well, you know, when they would scourge people, this is, this is how they would do it and this is the effect it have on the body and this is what the crucifixion and read medical reports and some of it is just sickening when you start reading through it. The gospel writers just tell what happened. They don't go into the, all the gory details and so I'm not gonna do that either. But we know enough about it, and, and some of these were so well known, they really didn't have to explain. We know what the scourging was, though. That's when they would take that whip that had several strands coming off of it. I think Bradley was telling me this morning, between seven and 11 strips, and take that and whip Jesus with that 49 times, and, and each of the end, end of each of those strands is some little piece of stone or broken pottery or piece of glass or something to, to rip the flesh open. And so the scourging was indeed a painful, horrible ordeal, and it's only the beginning. And it was the way the Romans would prepare the body for crucifixion. And so they scourged Jesus and then delivered him to be crucified. After they scourged him, they mocked him. It is as though once one was committed to crucifixion, to those round about, it's almost as though they're not human anymore. No pity is shown. And to be able to mock someone going through such Agony just seems inhuman itself, doesn't it? But here's how they mocked him. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered into him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on a scarlet robe. You know, the color purple was the color of kings. And scarlet would have been a color similar to that, but a cheaper garment but they're gonna dress him up. So they, they put on him a scarlet robe and when they planted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. I think of these old Bradford pears around here, the, the calorie pears, you know, that have gotten grown wild and those horrible thorns that are out there. Think about taking some strand of some kind of thorns like that and making a crown of thorns. You know how it is when something sticks your head? It hurts, doesn't it? And they're doing this to mock him. And then they put this reed in his hand, in his right hand, and bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, king of the Jews. Well, a reed is just a flimsy little stalk of a, of a grass that grows in the water. There would be no strength to it. And, and it was simply something to mock him, making him look like he's holding a king's scepter. And so in this ridiculous outfit, they dress. Jesus to humiliate him and mock him. And he endured the shame, didn't he? Despising the shame, he endured the cross. So they're bowing, mocking him. Hey, O king of the Jews. And then they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. It just seems almost childish, doesn't it? The way that they're behaving toward Jesus. After that they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled him to bear his cross. Cyrene is a city in North Africa. And there were Jews living in North Africa, so Simon, being a Jewish name, probably a Jew, come from North Africa. What would he be doing there? Well, he's probably there to, to keep the Passover feast. This was the time of the Passover. He had no idea what he was getting into when he showed up, but the Roman soldiers could compel you to go a mile with them and to bear a burden. Remember how Jesus had said, if, if you are compelled to go a mile, go with him twain? And so they look around and they say, well, this Simon looks stout enough, healthy enough. Let him carry the cross. And this is probably the, the cross beam, not the entire cross that they hung him on, but at least that beam that they would use to hang him on there. Now, 
the story is told, and we put it in a lot of our songs, that, that Jesus fell beneath the cross. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it never says that. Now, certainly if Jesus would have borne his own cross, it's easy for us to, to, to see how that having been up all night long and in such agony and such emotional agony to begin with, and then enduring these trials and this scourging, would he have any energy to bear that cross? If he would try, certainly you'd think he would fall beneath it. But the scriptures never actually say that he fell beneath it. But this Simon, he is compelled to, to bear this beam up to the hill where they're going to crucify Jesus. When they were come to the place that is called Golgotha, that is the, say, the place of a skull. It's interesting now that after the years have passed, they're not exactly sure which hill this is around Jerusalem. It must be near one of the city gates and outside the city walls, so that narrows it down. And the word Golgotha is an Aramaic word that means skull. And so, the place of the skull. The um, Greek word for skull is from the word, we get our word cranium. It's a crania. Well, why was it called the place of the skull? Why ever it was. It sounds like a horrible place, doesn't it? Now, some have seen this hill or a hill like this in a location that would fit, and, and they've seen the holes in the side of the mountain, and they say, look, you look at those holes. It looks like two eyes in, a, in an empty place for the nose there, and it looks like a skull. And I've seen slides of that and pictures of that. I never would have thought that unless someone pointed it out to me and showed me on those Slides and, and maybe that's why it was called the place of the skull. There's another old legend that they found a skull on this hill or somewhere about this hill, a, a large, very large skull. And so they called that the place of the skull because the skull was, was actually found there. None of those explanations ever really satisfied me. Well, I got curious this afternoon and looked and looked and looked and and then the idea came, and, and it was verified by some of the things I read, the, the idea of the cranium. You know what we call the cranium? That's the top part of the skull, isn't it? Not the facial part, which we usually think of, but, but the cranium, that's up here. And that maybe that was the shape of the hill, shaped like a cranium. Well, that's the Greek word. And so that might be, we don't know exactly, but this simply calling it the place of the skull sounds horrible enough, doesn't it? So they take him to Golgotha. You may have heard of the hill of Calvary. Well, when they translated the Bible into Latin, they called that Calvary. That's the Latin word for skull. And so the, the hill of Calvary. And then when they put it in the King James Version, they, they borrowed from that Latin word. And so you've got the hill of Calvary. That's Golgotha. That's the place of the skull. And they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Well, have you ever tried to drink vinegar? I wouldn't want to drink that either. And especially once they mingled it with gall. That just doesn't sound appetizing at all, does it? Well, this wasn't a drink to, to have a refreshing drink or, or to enjoy. It said to put this gall in with the vinegar would turn this into a potent medicine that by drinking of it would dull the senses so that what was going on would be easier to endure and, and not as horrible to feel as though if you do it without drinking it. But when they offer this to Jesus, he wouldn't drink it. He's going to bear the full thing with all of his consciousness as he goes through this agony. And so they crucified him. 
And they parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. So the, the clothes that he wore, they took them off and said, who gives this? Well, they had a, it's like rolling a dice or drawing sticks or some kind of random way that they would select, flip a coin or something like this, casting of lots, they call it. And whoever won that, well, they would take his garments. And that fulfilled the prophecy. But then one of the most horrible verses in the Bible, that sitting down, they watched him there. Why would you want to watch something like this take place? It's almost as though this, this will be our entertainment for the evening. We'll watch this man die in his agony on the cross. And they set up over his head the accusation written, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. That's what they had accused him of. That was supposedly the, the verdict that was resulting in his crucifixion, an insurrection against Rome. It was put there in part to mock the Jews themselves that had brought Jesus to them, because in another account they asked him to say, he, say, he said I was King of the Jews, but Pilate left it written just as it was. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And we read about these thieves in the other accounts. Now, in this account, the thieves are going to be mocking him. But in the other account, one of those thieves decides to ask Jesus, said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And that is not told in the Matthew's account. But I know you've heard that many times about the thief on the cross. Well, it was one of these two thieves. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. If thou be the Son of God. If thou be the Son of God. What does that remind you of? When the devil was tempting the Lord in the wilderness when he hungered, if thou be the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And now the devil's tempting him through those that are passing by, just wagging their heads. He's mocking him still. He said he'd destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. If thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests. Now these are supposed to be the dignified men, aren't they? They don't speak to Jesus. They mock him to each other. They say things to each other that, that those around could hear and get their chuckles from what they say. The chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, he saved others. He cannot, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. They weren't going to believe him. Well, he had already performed so many wonders in their presence. If they were going to believe, they would believe. They had the evidence. And he's going to do something greater than come down from the cross. He is going to rise from the dead, and they still don't believe. If he had come down from the cross at that moment, they wouldn't have believed him. They'd already decided not to believe him. He trusted God. Let him deliver him now. If he will have him, And they're saying this so Jesus can hear. His Father in heaven. Then he called out twice from the heavens, this is my beloved Son. And they're saying, if he will have him. He said, for he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. 
And so they're saying it in such a way to cast something into the teeth. They're, they're just saying it to him themselves in such a way to, to cause him the most shame. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land into the ninth hour. The sixth hour would be about 12 noon, the way we reckon time, and the ninth hour, three o'clock, and there's darkness over the land. You can literally, literally call this the darkest day of history. Some say, well, there must have been an eclipse. You know, we had an eclipse here in Warren County just this, this last year, didn't we? We had an eclipse. It didn't last three hours. It just lasted a few minutes. I mean, if you weren't out in the yard looking for it, and you could have missed it. You could have missed the whole thing. It wasn't three hours of darkness. And besides that, this is the time of the Passover. The Passover occurs after the first full moon of the spring equinox. When, when there's a full moon, the moon is opposite the sun. It's not over here aligned with the sun to provide an eclipse. It is on the opposite side of the sun. This was no eclipse. This was something else taking place here that brought this darkness. And how symbolic that darkness would have been on that time while Jesus is hanging on that cross. Didn't Jesus say, this is your hour and the power of darkness? So with three hours of darkness, and about the ninth hour, that'd be about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And that is Aramaic. Aramaic's a language similar to the Hebrew, not exactly to the Hebrew, but similar to that. And he said, the meaning is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we tremble at those words. And we wonder, did God really forsake him there? I tell you, it certainly didn't look like it. And Jesus may have felt forsaken there. These words are the words that open up the 22nd Psalm. But as you read through that Psalm... You'll read in that psalm, it says, when he cried out unto him, he heard, the Lord heard. So in some measure, the Lord allowed him, forsook him, yes, allowed him to go through this and withheld his wrath while he went through it. Was he utterly forsaken? Well, some think so, but it doesn't exactly say that, but there's no question that that, that was on the mind there. Some of them that stood near when he heard that said, this man calleth for Elias. Well, that'd be Elijah. And, and it's been suggested here that maybe they couldn't really understand what he was saying. He's, he's in such agony. He's up on the cross. He hasn't had anything to drink all this time. Maybe he can't pronounce his words well and they misheard. And so one of them, it says a straightway, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on the reed and gave him to drink. Maybe if we moisten his lips, he'll be able to speak more plain. We'll understand what he said. The rest said, let be. Let us see where their lives will come and save him. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. The word ghost is the word usually translated spirit. This is his death when the spirit departs from that body. So now let's go from the cross to the tomb. Here's the burial. Several things took place from the time he yielded up the ghost to the time he was buried in the tomb. One, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to bottom. You'd think it'd rip from the bottom to the top if someone was ripping it, but there was a tall curtain and it ripped from the top. It's like it's being ripped from above, isn't it? And, and this veil of the temple was that which would separate the holy place from the most holy place. And the most holy place is the place where, where God would dwell among the people in the most holy place. And the temple is ripped from the top to the bottom. The moment he dies. And so symbolically it shows that the way to God has now been opened, doesn't it? And it says that the, 
earth did quake and the rocks rent and the graves were opened. Well, they would bury them in the tombs and the rocks and with the earthquake, these, these tombs hewn out of these rocks, they were, they were left open so the bodies are exposed. And then a strange thing takes place that we only read about in Matthew. It says that the bodies of the saints, many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now they didn't arise at his crucifixion. At the crucifixion, the graves were open because the rocks were rent. But when Christ arose, Many that were in those graves arose as well and went into Jerusalem. Well, surely, all that was done to evidence the fact that Jesus is the Christ. Now, the centurion saw this. When the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. These were no ordinary events. And those Roman soldiers that crucified him were convinced. Now, there were some women there. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. Well, now that's Salome. The Zebedee and Salome, they had children, so there's three women there. Is this second Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus? It doesn't say that. Although Mary the mother of Jesus had two sons, two other sons, one of them had more than two other sons, but two of her sons was named James and Joseph, and I didn't go back and, and look at that this afternoon, but you look at the other accounts, and this is probably not Mary, the mother of Jesus. There was another Mary that had two sons named James and Joseph as well. And those were apostles of Jesus. James the last is what we call the one. And so it's probably that Mary. Now, the Mary, the mother of Jesus, is there, we learn from another account, and she's with, with John, standing off aside there with John but maybe not necessarily with these three women. Now, when the even was come, there was a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was a disciple, was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. He was a rich man. He'd had his own tomb carved out of the rock. And yet he goes to Pilate, says, let me have his body. I'll bury him in my tomb. And so they wrapped him in the linen cloth and laid him in, in Joseph's tomb. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together to Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said while he was yet alive after three days I'll rise again. Command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away to say to the people he's risen from the dead. So the last error shall be greater than the first, worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, ye have a watch. Now watch is a body of men to guard something. You have a watch. Go your way. Make it sure as you can. It's pointed out in class this morning that maybe Pilate, that you know he might rise through the, you just do the best you can and see. Maybe. They said make it sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure sealing the stone and setting a watch. The seal would be some, some clay that they would take and, and paste on that stone in such a way that if the stone was moved, the seal would be broken. It would be stamped, probably with Pilate's own stamp to let everyone know, you don't touch this. And if the stone is moved, we'll know it because the seal will be broken. 
So they stilled the stone and they set a watch. Now the last chapter, the resurrection. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. I say that just shows that angel. I say, oh, I'm going to roll the stone away and I'm just going to sit there. No one's going to stop this angel, are they? And his countenance was like lightning and his raiment as white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Here are the living keepers there as dead men. And that dead Christ is now alive. Well, the angel answered and said to the women, Fear ye not, for I know that ye seek Jesus which is crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. I always thought the angel rolled the stone to let Jesus out of the tomb. But he didn't have to move that stone to let Jesus out of the tomb. Jesus could appear and reappear after he rose from the grave, couldn't he? And show up in places and leave and without even opening the door. He could have left that tomb. Why'd they roll the stone away? To, to let the witnesses in and see the tomb was empty. See where the Lord lay? He's not here. He's risen, as he said. Come see where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I've told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. Now what happened on their way to the disciples? Here it is. As they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. They not only saw the open tomb, they saw the risen Lord. And Jesus said to them, be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee. There they shall see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city to show unto the chief priests the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money to the soldiers saying, say ye, his disciples came by might and stole him away while you slept. You see a problem with that? I mean, they were to guard that tomb at the risk of their life. And, and you think they know who came and stole him while they were asleep? They didn't know what was going on while they were asleep. The whole story is preposterous. And there is no explanation for the empty tomb, except for the resurrection. Well, if this come to the governor's ears, we'll persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee in a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. We don't know who it was that doubted. Probably some that were in Galilee that had been his disciples. We don't know why they doubted or how long they doubted, but they'd heard. Maybe they doubted at first. Maybe when they first saw him, they, it can't be him, but he would provide evidence, as it says in Acts, by many infallible proofs. They didn't doubt long. Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Well, there's a story of Matthew. Do you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? If you don't, how do you explain the empty tomb? How could all these things have been written at a time when men could have refuted these things and found that it was impossible to do so? And many in that day believed, and they believed because of what they'd heard from the witnesses. And it's just as true now as it was then. And so we need to be baptized. 
Go ye in all the world and make disciples, baptizing them. Notice that expression. How do you become a disciple of Christ? You make disciples, baptizing them. If I told you to clean the carpet, vacuuming it, well, the vacuuming would tell you how to clean the carpet, wouldn't you? Make disciples, baptizing them. Baptizing them tells you how you're made a disciple. And so we offer the invitation. You want to be baptized? You want to be a disciple of Christ? Well, we'll baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach you to deserve all things whatsoever he's commanded. Respond to that invitation, then let that be known as we stand and sing.